it's very likely that the changes in the brain didn't happen overnight. There wasn't one magical mutation that miraculously allowed us to speak and to walk upright and to cooperate with one another and to figure out how the world works. Evolution doesn't work that way. It would be staggeringly improbable for one mutation to do all of that. Chances are there were lots and lots of mutations over a span of tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years that fine-tuned and sculpted the brain to give it all the magnificent powers that it has today. The actual organization of behavior goes on at the level of the individual nerve cells and their connections. We have 100 billion nerve cells, probably 100 trillion connections. It's just mind-boggling to think of all the different ways in which they are arranged. And a lot of our evolution consisted not just in getting more of this stuff, but in wiring it in precise ways to support intelligence. So it may not have been the size of the human brain but it's wiring that endowed us with powerful new skills. According to Richard Wrangham, one of these skills was the knack for living a complex social life. Here in East Africa, chimpanzees show us how we might have interacted with others before the mind's big bang. Social climbing is the one thing that really makes a male's world. But they do it not in just a one-to-one -one way. They're very sensitive to the interactions among each other. So if I have a friend that I am trying to impress, then maybe what I will do is to attack the enemy of my friend. And the enemy of my friend might be doing something like grooming with uh, one of his friends. So I may detect the relationships among other chimps and manipulate them to my own advantage. But what we share with the chimps is an ability to be very subtle in the way in which we can understand the meaning of an interaction that we see in terms of its threat to our own social standing. In humans, a, uh, a little word to the father of a badly behaved adolescent and all of a sudden you can control their behavior but no such thing happens with chimps you have to actually exert physical force or the threat of physical force but after about six million years of separate evolution humans acquired a significant social advantage how much subtler how much more satisfying if the council of elders can sit around the fire at night and say you know, Joe there, he's behaving really badly. We've got to do something about him. That's what chimps can't do. There's much more chimpanzees cannot do. The University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Here, Andrew Whiten considers differences between chimp minds and human minds. With unlikely tools, he and others have identified another critical advantage and possibly a key to the human mind's stunning success. Okay. Mind reading. Will this three-year-old be able to look at things from someone else's point of view? Can she make inferences about others' thoughts? Can she spot deception? Sally. Sally, watch this. She's going to go put the marble in the basket. Are you ready? Cover it up. Okay. And then Sally's going to go out to play, like you did out in the garden. Really? Off she goes. Okay, she's going out to play, and while she's out to play, here's Naughty Anne coming, and she's going to take the marble out of the basket. While Sally is away, deceitful Anne marbles. will now hide no, Sally's marble. Yeah. Go in. There we go. And then Anne's going to come over here. And do you know what's happening? Where did Sally go? She went out to play. Where's she gone? She's coming back. And she's going to come and look for her favourite marble. Where's Sally going to look for her marble now? I think she's in here. Mm, you think Sally's going to look in there? Why do you think she's going to look in there? I think she found it. That's where it was. Through the okay. age of three, researchers have found that a child is unable to ascribe actions, motives, and beliefs to others. But by the age of five, the child's brain has developed a capacity for stepping into someone else's mind. This is Sally. Sally is coming back from playing. And Sally's going to go and look 
for her marble. Where is she going to look for her marble? She's going to... Mm. Oh, where's she going to look? Basket. In the basket. Okay, shall we let her look in the basket? Yep. Oh. Why did she look in the basket? Because the marble could have been there, but yeah. it wasn't. Okay, so where is the marble? Do you remember? Okay. Well, do you want to help? It varies in different children, but generally the, the four-year stage is thought of as a kind of watershed when that particular refined theory of mind ability uh, emerges. So a three-year-old would typically have difficulty with it. A five-year-old has generally mastered it. And so far, no chimpanzee has passed uh, any test of the attribution of false belief that a five-year-old child uh, passes. I suppose theory of mind, you know, makes us as sublime as, as we are because we can feel for others so much, perhaps, you might say on the one hand. At the same time, it allows us to, it allows us to be um, that much more sneaky than, than any other species on the planet. In societies of humans, being socially competent really counts. Being socially competent allows you ultimately to outcompete others to gain better access to uh, resources, the, the best mates. And in those kind of societies, it seems that brain can be more important than brawn. So it's potentially a very powerful evolutionary force because it, it's driving a, a kind of upward spiral. Social complexity begets greater social intelligence. Social intelligence uh, presents even greater problems to the individuals in the next generation, and they have to become more socially complex. Complex social relationships, a theory of mind. These are abilities we associate with modern humans. But how could we express any of these abilities without language? With language, we can recall the past, point to the future, teach children, tell secrets, manipulate crowds. But imagine a world without language. Nicaragua, Central America. Managua. Here, as in other places of the world, there are those who hardly have any language at all. Maria Noname, Mary No Name. Deaf since birth, she has been isolated all her life, both from the people who could help her and from others with her disability. Her friend, linguist Judy Kegel, understands the depth of her isolation. The two can communicate just a little, using simple and primitive gestures. The first time I met her, she was missing the ability to tell me who she was. She was missing the ability to tell me how old she was. She doesn't know her name. In order to tell me who she was, she had to take me home and show me the papers and pictures of her family. Um, we had to share a context. She can tell me things. I can show you a bit. She can tell me what happened to her father. Hmm. I asked her about her father dying, and she said three, okay? What three meant was he was shot three times. I know this from working with the other deaf signer, that she said he was shot in three places. And that's how her father died, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, you know, but, but three is just not enough to give me access to the information that I would have needed had I not had prior knowledge about that. Papa. Papa. Okay. What she's saying is, I had a daughter that went away and got married, and that was it. She never came back. I had a son that went away, and I never heard from him again. You know, that's it. I'm alone. That's my life. She was language ready. Um, the problem was she didn't get access to language within that critical period. And that critical window for learning language in the way that we learned it is closed. 